You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Very excited uh, to talk with our guest today because uh, it is a name that had been mentioned in this podcast, I don't know, I want to say six times or so, and finally, I was uh, catching a clue from my friend Margaret Stewart about an author that I had to start reading, and that is Kirsten Modlin, uh, who is joining us today. She is the Amazon top 10 best-selling author so far with 35 books to her credit. Uh, so she is a twisty thriller writer that you probably already are enjoying. If not, you're definitely going to need to add her books to her TBR list. And I've just finished up A Quiet Retreat, which is available in paperback. It was released over Halloween. And I also was just listening to and finished the great audiobook, which is If You're Reading This. So I'm so excited to speak to you today, joining from Nashville. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Congratulations, first of all, for all of your success. And also what I think is the greatest author kind of tagline possible, which is love, lies, and alibis. I mean, you are so good at all of this branding and marketing and obviously storytelling, a gift with words. Thank you so much. Yeah, I I struggled a little bit with the tagline in the beginning, and I just thought that it fits all my books so well. It really, you know, I write the domestic and psychological thrillers, so it just ties it all in. Oh, it's absolutely perfect. I was going through your book list, and I mean, wow, okay, that is impressive. I Most people would be happy if they were saying, I've read 35 domestic thrillers, <laughs> never mind, written 35. And um, I mean, it is, it, it's also, I was noticing that you're, you're very uh, clever and kind of concise with your words in particular with your titles because you've got like a lot of very simple uh, the nanny and the missing in that I mean when when you're coming up with this stuff you kind of just know exactly what a reader want, wants and you are not overcomplicating it yeah yeah I really so I say that I write for women who are like me um, I'm a busy mom I have a ton going on so when I sit down to read I want to pick up a book and just dive right in know what I'm getting from the story and be surprised along the way with plot twists and so those are the kinds of books that I write. I don't overcomplicate the titles. If you pick up my book, you're pretty much going to know what to expect just from that title. And then, yeah, I, I don't waste a lot of time with filler or fluff or description. We dive right into the meat of the story and just really get into the mystery of it, which which is, are the types of books that I love to read. And thankfully, I've found readers just like me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. To me, it's my favorite genre because it is engrossing right away. Um, it gets in your mind because you really do need to know what is going to happen. These are the kind of books that you could never walk away from. I mean, everybody has maybe, and I, I, I never say them out loud, but a book that you're going like, I'm just not going to finish this one. You know, um, this is the t style of book and with your fantastic writing that you could never do that because we must know what's going on and we know that we're going to be surprised. So tell me a little bit about A Quiet retreat for those listeners who have not read it yet. Yeah, so A Quiet Retreat is a psychological thriller set at a writer's retreat. It's about a group of five writers who go, they stay at this retreat, they've all received these mysterious invitations, um, and they go to this retreat, and strange things start to happen pretty quickly. Um, and they start um, kind of thinking, is someone you know out to get us? Is there a reason we were all invited? And it's just a whirlwind story where they're, they're in this house for a week and all this bad stuff starts to happen and they have to figure out what's going on and who's after them. And what was really surprising about this was that you're also giving us two different timelines, two different storylines that of course will, will have significant significance to each other um, current and in the past. So, and that was a, a, a really, um, sometimes there, there are books where you can feel like, oh, that's kind of taking me away. This was really building for me every single time, the tension and anticipation and, and, and the way that we like to read this and try to be connecting the dots. But both, I thought both storylines uh, were equally compelling. Of course, the focus being though, um, the modern day uh, writer's retreat. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I loved playing with the parallels between the two stories because you go into the second one, not really knowing how it fits in, just like you said. So you're like, you know, is this part of a book? Is this, you know, one of the characters backstories? What is going on? And, and I played a lot with just different parallels between what we were learning about the characters in present day and what was going on, you know, in the past. And um, until the end, you don't really know how it all clicks together. I've, I've seen that done so brilliantly in, in in some books and something I've real, always really wanted to play with. Um, and so I was really excited to get to do that with this one and, and make it all, you know, fit together. I enjoy the fact that writers seem to really enjoy writing about writers, right? <laughs> they, they, writers love to write about the process of writing and about maybe and life as a writer and the way that they, you know, navigate the world or tell their stories or, or survive in their business. And so what's it, the, the dynamics of the people who are put together in this home, in this writer's retreat, are really interesting. And I, I would imagine that each one was sort of loosely based on maybe somebody that you either read or, or, or know from some of these uh, writers' organizations and, and events that you do around the country. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I really wanted to do with this one, and I write about writers a lot in my book. Um, I kind of wanted to do like a peek behind the curtain at what it's like to be a writer, what it's like to attend these various you know, retreats and um, co conventions like I go to um, and conferences. And so it was really fun to kind of do that and get, let you see kind of a peek behind the curtain, like I said, of, you know, how writers interact with each other. And one thing I did with this is all of the interactions and personalities came from real writers that I've either met or looked up to. Um, and so they're, they're definitely very loosely based on other people or a mesh of certain other writers. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun to kind of play around with that. And I think, you know, one thing as writers, we're often told, write what we know. And what do we know better than other writers and, write, you know, being a writer ourselves. So it's a lot of fun to do that. And I think readers find it interesting. I hope readers find it interesting, too. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I definitely do. I mean, I, I love to talk to writers. It's so exciting to kind of figure out how the brains tick and, and how these stories come to life that uh, are so engrossing for us. I mean, it's such a fantastic escape and, you know, without question, one of my favorite hobbies. Um, it was it was so fun to kind of look at these people who are put in this place. We've got uh, two guys and three women, and they're all sort of, um, well, they're writing, writing, they're writing in, in within the same space, but but kind of different genres or different focuses. There's a cozy mystery and there's um, somebody who everybody kind of considers to be a really celebrated success. I mean, you're almost thinking, I don't know, you're almost thinking like a Stephen King or something as if he's walking in to, to live in a house with you for the next four days so that you guys can all work on your books. I mean, it would be pretty, pretty wild. Um, I But I, I like the idea of what is it that you get from friendships with other writers and from getting together and talking about your craft? How does it, how does it, um, how do you get comfort from it or inspiration from it? How, why, why is it important for you? Yeah, it's so important because being a writer is such a solitary thing. You know, most days we're in our offices. You can see my office behind me. We're in our offices plucking away at stories that, you know, maybe no one's ever going to read. Maybe people aren't going to like. Um, and so we're in our heads a lot. We're, you know, my husband is constantly like, are you listening to me? Because <laughs> I'm all over the place. And I'm like, no, I was, I was plotting, you know, we're always in our heads. We're always alone. And so getting to go to like conferences or conventions or writers retreats where you get to talk to other writers they're the only ones in the world who truly get it and so it's just like any other industry where you're going and you're talking to your co-workers or you're venting to your co-workers writers get writer problems you know <laughs> they know the struggle and so it's really important um you know to know other writers whether it's you know online or in person just so you can talk through everything and they're the only people that want to listen to the plot outline that you might write someday <laughs> and help you work through the problems with it so um, as much as I try to like lay, um, lean into my husband and tell him all the struggles, it's much easier to talk to a writer who really gets it. Well, it's kind of hilarious. Then your household is just the the reversed of most households across the country, right? <laughs> where where the wife is saying to the husband, like, "Hello, are you listening to me?" He's like, "What? What? What?" <laughs> so <laughs> it's so true, yeah. And and my husband, he stays home and and helps with takes care of our daughter and helps with the house, and so he is like tries to help as much as he can, but he just does not get the writing 
portion of it. And so he's like, I will talk to you about ads all day long. I cannot talk to you about writing. So I noticed there was, was one a uh, real life author name that did make the pages of this book. There's a little wink to uh, one of our favorites around here. Oh, yes. Colleen Hoover. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, I couldn't write a book about writers without mentioning her. I mean, she has just taken the world by storm. I absolutely love Verity. That's one of my favorite books. And she's just I think she's an amazing person. And so, yeah, one of the, the writers in there makes a little mention that her daughter likes Colleen Hoover more than her, her own books, um, which I just thought was hilarious. And, you know, growing up, um, being a writer in the time of the Colleen Hoover, Hoover era, is definitely something interesting and so it was just a fun little nod to her <laughs> yeah that was that was really good I, I loved that um and thinking about the way that you're publishing as well and i and i did think of her as i was reading this actually um in, in general uh for, for for the way that the, your stories play out and that kind of the 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 ease um, with which you can read it and just kind of get into it and, and and care right away and and also the substance that you're providing um to, to understand especially our, our heroines um so the, the business is so wild. Are you doing this sort of hybrid of self-publishing and traditional publishing? It was funny because when, when the audio of If You're Reading This came came up into my neck alley, I assumed that that was your most recent book. And then it's like, wait, no, no, no. She's, she, she's got them coming like a rapid fire. So how do you manage the business part of it? And it seems like the industry is in such an interesting time right now. So you clearly have it figured out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have it figured out, but I'm certainly trying. I um, I started publishing in 2016, um, which was kind of when, you know, indie publishing, which is mostly what I do, um, the self-publishing side of things was was still kind of new, but it was it was coming up. It certainly wasn't as big as it is now, um, but that's how I got into publishing. Um, and so I self-publish or indie publish all of my books. Um, but then I actually have an agent who sells my audio. And so my audio goes through a publisher and they handle that, which is why there's a delay. They're amazing and they work so fast, but I get them my book and then it releases like two weeks later. <laughs> um, so then they have to work with, you know, narrators and producers to actually get the audio made. And it usually comes out about two months behind um, the eBooks and paperbacks and all of that. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Just like you said, I always have an audio, you know, getting ready to come out and it's two weeks behind everything else. Um, and by that point, I usually have a new book that I'm promoting. So I always kind of feel like I'm juggling you know, a hundred things at once, uh, which is, which is always fun. <laughs> That's amazing. Were you, so now that you're kind of a little newer to hearing your books uh, brought to life on audio, what is that experience like? I mean, I, I had been completely resistant to audiobooks until 2020 uh, when everything <laughs> changed. And I mean, they have just brought me so much joy and allowed me to be, you know, always reading physically one book or on the Kindle or whatever and listening to one, which, for my brain keeps the stories really separate, even if it's the same genre, it works for me. And it's just amazing, like, you know, to be able to do your laundry and do all of like the stuff or pretend you're helping with homework, but really be having that one earbud in <laughs> actually listening, listening to an audiobook is so much fun. Yeah. So uh, same as you, I kind of avoided it for a while. Um, I did nonfiction audio because it kind of felt like a podcast. Yeah. And so I was like, I can do this. But fiction books were a struggle for me because I was like, I really have to focus and I like, can't zone out. You know, I have to listen, um, especially because I mostly read thrillers. So it's like a mystery. You have to put the pieces together. Um, but then I started listening to my own books on audio. And it's so funny because I can't read my own books. Like once they're out there, I don't reread them because I would like nitpick the whole thing. I'm like, oh, you should have, you know, worded this better. That sentence should have happened here. Oh, you use the same word in the same paragraph. <laughs> like I just drive myself crazy. But audiobooks are different because it feels like a totally separate thing. There's nothing I can do to it. I can't go back and fix it. And so it's almost like I can enjoy my books um, through audio better than I can actually the actual book. And it's almost like a movie. And sometimes I forget that I wrote it and I just really get to enjoy it. And it's so fun. Um, and so that has actually gotten me into fiction audiobooks, just listening to my own. And then now I can can enjoy them from other people too. That is uh, so cool. Yeah. It, yeah. Getting you're sort of getting that little bit of experience of what your readers are, are having when they're enjoying your work, which is the just enough detachment, right? It's like not wanting to watch yourself on television or something. I totally get it. 
Exactly. Yeah. So tell um, for those who are listening. I mean, I really loved that book as well. So give it give us the little uh, synopsis of if you're reading this. Yeah. So if you're reading this is about a recently widowed woman named Colby. Um, She actually her husband died um, on their wedding day. And so it opens with her sitting in the hospital. Um, You know, her her gown is covered in blood and she talks about how, you know, she's just lost her husband or her soon to be husband. Um, And then it flashes forward and most of the book happens um, a year in the future at their one year anniversary, um, what would have been their anniversary. And she has this box of letters that wedding guests were going to give them. They they put them in a box and they were supposed to open them on their one year anniversary. Um, Of course, her husband's not there. So she takes her three male best friends and they all go on a getaway and they open them. And there's one surprise letter in there um, that makes her realize maybe she doesn't know the truth about the man she was going to marry and how he actually died. Mm, it is a uh, it's it's just it's great because well you you you're writing in in I imagine all of your work but in in, in these two certainly um very interesting strong female characters who who have um you know a very defined sense kind of of the world they're going through some big challenges they're strong and they're 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 working to save themselves through yes. challenging situations. Yes, and I even include that in, in a quiet retreat. The women save themselves. You know, that's a big <laughs> thing for me. Um, in a lot of domestic thrillers, and that's one thing I love about the genre, you deal with strong women. You may not like the women. They may be really unlikable, but they are strong. They're not waiting around for, you know, a man or anyone else to save them. And I just think that that's so important. You know, I don't want to wa- write weak characters. I want to write women that you root for, you know, like I said, whether they're likable or not, you want to root for them. And so, yeah, that's just really important to me and something I've tried to do with all my books. There's some reference in A Quiet Retreat to um, comments or feedback about books. So, you know, negative reviews or, you know, uh, the the, the blurbs that describe books or, you know, being willing to endorse a book or not or, you know, uh, uh, responses to mentions of particular genres of writing. So um, what is something that readers should never say to an author? Oh, I think when it comes to negative reviews, everyone is obviously entitled to their opinion. I think the best thing you can do is if you're going to say a book is bad, don't say, don't say the book is bad. Don't say this is an awful book. This is her worst book. This is, you know, a terrible say I didn't like it as much or make it about your opinion and your experience rather than the book in general, because the thing is, nobody reads the same book. We're all reading these books and we're all taking our own life experiences, um, you know, and our own experiences into the story. And that's what we're, and it could be, you know, you had a bad day and so you didn't like it, or, you know, you had a bad experience with a character like this or a person like this. So I think the thing is just to remember that every book is your own experience. And rather than just saying, you know, this book was awful, say it wasn't for me. Um, And I think that's just the nicest way that you can do it. And just remember that we're all human and we're just trying to to tell stories and entertain people. Yeah. Amen to that. Maybe you didn't like it because you're just a jerk. You're just jealous (laughs) because you can't write. Oh, it's like, it's like a, you know, if you tell a kid, oh, you're trying this food or whatever. Don't say I hate it or whatever. It's not my favorite. Exactly. This genre is not my favorite. This, this book wasn't my favorite or, or whatever. Right. Yes, exactly. That's what we have to tell our daughter about food. Exactly. <laughs> We're like, you might not like it today. You'll try it next week. You might like it then. <laughs> yeah, never know. Exactly. Um, tell me, please, about how you structure your day and your writing calendar or, you know, what your space is for, what time of day you're writing, what you need with you, what's the perfect writing conditions for you, because you, you clearly are very disciplined and productive time-wise, I mean, because you are, you have having these novels come out at a really impressive pace. Yeah. So I release about every other month. Um, I always aim for every month, uh, but it's never happened so far. So every month seems to be my happy space. Um, but I write, I treat this like a day job. So I write, I'm at my desk every day at eight o'clock and I work until about five. Um, and most of that is spent writing. I usually spend an hour or two in the morning um, responding to emails, checking social media, checking all of my like ads and everything like that. Um, but the rest of the day is spent writing and um, writing is my favorite thing to do. So that's, it, it always feels like I'm coming to work to play. I'm not, you know, going to work and it's, you know, I've worked day jobs before that I hated. So this is just so much fun for me. 
Um, and I also, when I first started publishing, um, I didn't have, you know, a huge budget to put into ads and everyone said, you know, nothing will sell your last book like your next. And so that became my goal was just to put out as many quality books as I could um, and, and kind of look at it like a lottery. And hopefully with enough books, readers would find me. And obviously, you know, knock on wood, it seemed to have worked. And um, so, yeah, I just I release as much as I can and I write as often as I can. And even, you know, sitting at home when we're watching TV, I'll pull up my laptop and write a chapter if I'm bored. So it's just, it's what I love to do. And it, like I said, it never feels like work, which is awesome. Wow. So how do you keep though, how do you keep it all straight? I mean, have you ever found yourself like going, okay, I'm using, you know, oh, Blakely, wait, I used Blakely before in another book. I mean, how do you, I, do you, do you have any kind of system of what your, you know, whether it's places or scenarios or conversations or whatever that you've, that you've utilized so that you don't reuse? I mean, it just seems like, wow. I mean, it's amazing. Your, your mind must be very organized and compartmentalized in some, in some way. <laughs> I like to call it organized chaos. <laughs> um, you know, I, I try to keep up with, as far as main character names, I don't reuse those too often because I can kind of remember those. Yeah. Um, but I will tell a funny story. Um, I had a coworker at my day job before, um, and she was going to name her daughter Tuesday. And I thought Tuesday was just the cutest name. I was like, that's amazing. I'm going to use that. Um, and so last year I released a book with a character named Tuesday and I had a reader reach out after she read it and she was like, you used the name, the name Tuesday again. Is there any connection? And I was like, again, had I already used it? And I found out that I'd used that in 2019 to, <laughs> um, for a book that I've published. So I definitely get things mixed, mixed up for used names. Um, I try to set them either in fictional towns or the town where I live. So the setting, um, you know, don't too often get mixed up, but. Yeah, um, I try to keep it all organized, but it doesn't always work out. That is uh, hilarious. So maybe, uh, well, I guess the timing wouldn't be right, but it would be funny if your friend actually had gotten the baby name from your book, and then you thought you were getting a character name from her baby. <laughs> I, I know, right? It's like, no wonder I liked it. I already used it. <laughs> and when you're starting on your next one, are you are you free-flowing, it sounds like it, or are do you know where the these stories will end? Yeah, I so I always plot my books. Okay. I plot them by chapter. They're very loose outlines. I don't do, you know, a ton of outlining, but I do know where the book is going. Um, most often it changes a million times, but I try to have just a general idea of where I'm headed and I plot from the twist out. So my whole thing is, you know, my readers call me the queen of twists. I'm all about the big plot twist. And so I figure out what the plot twist is going to be. And then I build my plot and my characters around that. So almost always I know the big plot twist when I go into it. Ooh, that's so interesting. Yeah. That make, and it makes a lot of sense because you're thinking about the buildup and the everything else. I just, uh, I, I think that's what I love about thrillers so much is it just feels like it's, it's so, com it's complex because you've got, you're taking us on a nail biting journey and we... I mean, there is going to be a surprise and, and things do have to also add up. I mean, there's there's an accountability that has to exist in writing in writing and reading a thriller that that maybe is a little looser in other genres. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely really complex and you have to really work in all the, the you know, pieces of the spider web. You have to know why is the character saying this? And by the end of it is what they're saying here is still going to make sense. You have to make yeah. sure that all of your little breadcrumbs are being dropped at the right place. You know, I want... I don't want you to come to the end of my book and be like, that twist was out of nowhere. That makes I no want sense. You to be like, oh my gosh, of course. Now it all makes sense. And so you really have to think about the right places to drop the breadcrumbs so that readers aren't going to be like, oh, well, this is super obvious. Now I know where it's going. Um, and just really make it all fit in there while keeping them guessing and just giving them enough of a hint as to keep going. So it's it's a lot of work. It's a it's a big like mental, <laughs> mentally draining job, Seriously. honestly. Like I when I'm done for the day, my brain is just scrambled eggs. <laughs> I can't think um, about anything else. So don't don't ask me to remember. My memory is like a goldfish most days. Um, but well, I remember yeah, the plot. It so that's about it. Exactly. You've taxed yourself completely. I would imagine you are just totally fried after a full day of working all of this out. Who is it, considering especially the pace that you're publishing, who is it that is your go-to 
um, you know, beta reader? Do you have do you have these people? Are are there is there somebody in your in your personal life who is the person who is is your first voice that you want to hear as feedback to a book? Yeah, I do. It's um, it's actually my best friend who's also an author. Um, Emerald O'Brien is her name. Uh, we both publish the same genre, so we we kind of go into it knowing what readers are expecting. Um, but she gets my books as soon as they're finished. She gets them first, reads through them, and she'll make me notes all the way through. Um, and then we have like a, a two hour Skype call to discuss them. And I do the same for her. And so it's it's really fun. It's good to hear because that's the first time I'm really getting to hear my story from a reader point of view and seeing like what shocked her and where what was she guessing you know at this point in the story and this point um and that's really important because then if she's on to me i can switch it up and mix things up or if she like really hates a character that i want you to love i can fix that <laughs> um and so that's that's been really um you know in, instrumental in me having the books that i have and the career that i have is just having a, um, a really early reader who will tell me the truth tell me if it's awful um but will also help kind of guide me um when i'm not on the right track and and like i said i do the same for her and it's it's awesome. That is so cool. And that, that uh, collaborative spirit and the, the, the supporting of each other. And I think that that's one thing that I find so um, charming and, and, and I don't know, it just everything about the industry is so is so fascinating to me. But the, those friendships, especially, especially even within the same genre, because it's there there shouldn't be any sense of competition and, and the smart writers know that there isn't because readers we want like all the books like we, yes. we can't just choose just I mean we're not choosing just one it's not we're not buying one car we're buying buying borrowing you know renting all of the books <laughs> so so there's exactly. room for all yeah and and the thing is like I don't know about you but if I take time off of reading it's really hard for me to get back into mm -hmm. reading I take a long time, but if I'm reading constantly every day, then it's just part of the routine. So I want writers to keep producing books. So my readers will keep, you know, reading. And unless you can write enough to keep your readers constantly reading every single day. And believe me, I try. You're getting close, girl. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> you need other writers to be producing too. So yeah, it's not a competition. We really are out here, you know, feeding feeding the tank for everybody, I guess. Oh, I love that. Uh, do people get nervous when they meet you, say, or, 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 or are people anxious to maybe hope that they'll somehow inspire something in, in one of your books? Yeah, I think like readers at, at, at events and stuff, they get nervous. I'm always like, don't, I'm, I'm so <laughs> normal and awkward and it's, it's fine. We're going to be nervous together. Um, but they, they always tell me that they're nervous until they get there. And I think, you know, I, I've worked with with people my whole life. I'm, I'm really good at just talking and, and kind of hopefully bringing everybody to call, helping everybody to calm down. Um, but in real life, when people find out I'm an author, it's usually just like, oh, cool. You know, it's not, it's not that exciting. Um, I don't have my family. They keep me very humble. None of my family thinks that any, that what I do is very cool. So it's, uh, it's always interesting. Um, my daughter's teacher just found out what I do and that was a cool experience. She was like, you know, Char my daughter, Charlie, she was like, she told me, um, that you're an author and we did a deep dive <laughs> into, uh, your website and stuff. So that was a really cool experience, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty lackluster. <laughs> how, uh, how old is she? And, and does that now mean that the expectations for her to be writing uh, way better than her peers is already upon her? <laughs> so she's only six. Um, so she, well, she'll be six next month, actually. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself, but so she, um, I don't know if the expectations there just yet, but she wants to be a writer. She's all the time telling me story ideas. Ah. Um, I think at some point we'll end up co-writing like a children's book together, uh, which should be super fun. But she's always sitting down with some paper and she'll have like a drawing and she's like, this is what happens in the story. Oh. Um, so I, I love that I'm inspiring her. I never wanted to put you know, the pressure of you have to do what mommy does. Um, but if she does, I'll just be so honored and think it's, think it's amazing. So well, that, that, that yeah, is we'll amazing see. to see. And regardless, I mean, the, the idea of being able to have an active imagination to be able to, um, you know, write sort of, of the direction of whatever situation you, you're in. I mean, that's a gift that, that lasts a lifetime. And, and, and also obviously she's going to be probably an avid reader. It would be very strange if she wasn't because she knows the joy that a story can can bring and how it can take you away 
Yeah. Yeah. Something that I've, you know, when I had her, my husband is not a reader. Um, and so when I had her, I was like, don't you dare, we're going to teach her to read. She's going to read all the time. Don't you ever complain about reading? Um, and so that's been something, you know, as she was growing up, I, I just, we read to her every night. I'm constantly like, let's go to the bookstore and buy a new book. You know, I make it exciting. Um, and for a long time, she couldn't care less about books. Um, but finally she's gotten to where she's excited and she's picking out the books we're going to read each night. And so it makes me really happy. Um, and I also just think it's important for her and for everyone, you know, to see that people can achieve what they want to achieve. They can achieve their dreams. And, you know, I grew up in a really small town where, it, you know, it was kind of small minded and no one really thought that like I could do what I wanted to do or, you know, not that they were negative, but it just it didn't happen to people from our town and people like me. And um, so it's really cool for me like Charlie, when she's like, I want to be this, I'm like, you can, you can do it, girl. Like whatever you want to do. Whatever and I just you want. think that that mindset is important. Oh my gosh. That, that's the greatest gift that you can ever give a child, right? Is to, to yes. know that you've got these, these big wings that you're growing and, and you're going to be able to fly and, and do what you want to do if you're willing to put the, the work into it. And do the, what a shining example you are of that. Thank you. I try. <laughs> ah, so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and for your incredible work. And I just had so much fun with oh, this. I, I really, I really felt that I was there on this quiet retreat. And um, yeah, it was, it gave me all the things. So I was, it was so enjoyable start to finish. Um, I guess, you know, this, your next book will be, be out in like two days, right? <laughs> Basically. Um, my next book will release January 31st. So we're, we're almost there. <laughs> so also you can't possibly, I mean, it's wonderful to be able to speak to you and thank goodness for the technology of Zoom and all of this, because if you were trying to book tour every time you had a book out, you would A, never be able to write and like you would for sure never see your family. <laughs> yes, exactly. The one good thing, um, up until this year, my daughter started kindergarten, my, husband, my family could travel with me. Um, but yeah, now we're having to kind of cut back on the travel. But definitely couldn't go out on tour for every book. I'd be, <laughs> I'd never be home. <laughs> oh well, that is incredible. Um, the latest one, and and then the best part is, as you mentioned, you find a new book, and then if you haven't read her, like I had not until just a couple of weeks ago, you're going to want to dig back in uh, to that catalog, and it's all, and you know what, even on her website, when you go visit her, tell us what the website is again, because I know it's. I want to make sure it's I get it right. KirstenModulinAuthor.com. Don't leave the author part out. You can even get a PDF of the list of all of the books so that it's handy dandy. You save that as a document when you're looking for some inspiration and you know uh, that you can tap into one of these. So great. And then see what's coming out on audio as well. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak to you. Um, thank you so much. I hope it was a happy holiday season for you and uh, appreciate all of the work that you're doing. Can't, read to, can't wait to read more. Thank you so much for having me and for talking about the books. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you. You too. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.